It is never too late to become what you are destined to be. If you're struggling with finances or sickness or in your relationships or just in accepting you, I have hope for you for this show. Jesus came to give you an abundant life, not just one of surviving. With me today is Diana Seymour. She has conquered the hand-me-downs of bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and rejection. Diana is the real deal. It brought tears literally to my eyes when I read her story. It's, you ever have that moment that you just kind of have goosebumps and you just can't help it when you're reading it? Diana is an author and a Bible college instructor. She wrote the book, From Hand-Me-Downs to the Designer's Label. Today's show is about no longer wearing your hand-me-downs, but how to find and put on your own designer's label. Diana, welcome to the show. Thank you for letting me be here. Now, you wrote this book about hand-me-downs, and we said it a little bit, but those hand-me-downs for most of us usually start in our childhood. What were some of those for you? Well, for me, um, even though I, I grew up in a, a household of nine other kids. Um, nine? Was, nine kids? Nine of us, yeah. Whoa. There was still a lot of loneliness um, because my parents couldn't give us the time that was necessary for each child. So I was quite busy helping my mother raise the other children. And uh, she was uh, sick. She had a heart condition and there was no help for her for the type of heart condition that she had. Mm. So a lot fell to me to help her run the household. How old were you at the time? Uh, I would have been uh, about 10 when I had to do a lot of helping. And uh, that coupled with my father's alcoholism just, just didn't help in our household at all. What, what is it like to live with an alcoholic? Was he a nice alcoholic or a mean? Alcoholic? He was mean, he was scary. Um, we never knew from day to day um, what it was going to be like when he did come home. We didn't even know at times when he was going to come home. He, he could have been gone for a week or maybe even two weeks, but once, once his paycheck ran out, um, then he would come home and then there was no food. Paycheck, there was so he did not bring actually the money home or any of A lot of, that? of times we didn't see it, no. My mother... How, how do you survive on that? Did your mom work? She did when she could, but a lot of times it was government assistance. Oh, and wow. uh, she would try to use that as quickly as possible before he had a chance to get his hands on it. Oh, wow. The fear your mom constantly must have dealt with. And for you to help with eight siblings at the age of 10. 10. Wow. So... You know, it's basically survival mode all the time. Did you guys know God at the time? No, we didn't. Although, I think my mother did, because there were times when Dad was not around that she'd have the TV on. And now when I look back, she, she had to be a closet Christian, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was uh, now that I look at the programs uh, that we watched then, it was uh, Billy Graham and Oral Roberts. Oh, wow. So she had to have known God then. Why didn't she share it with you kids? Dad would not allow it. He, God was not allowed in our home. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was not allowed. So mom had to keep it quiet. And I wish she had let us know. Um, but I, I, I guess she was afraid that he would find out. And so uh, she, she would to herself. Yeah. Wow. And the now you said your mom had a bad heart and was in bad shape. Um, you know, if she's tried was there any way, how, how did that all work out? Did she get a surgery and she was all okay? or what No, happened? she couldn't have anything. The type of uh, heart condition that she had, it was back in 1966 when she passed away. And that's at the time that, I believe it was a South African doctor that did the first open heart surgery. That's what she would have required. Um, but would how it have worked? How did she pass away? Because nine kids, who, who was there when it happened? It was, it was the day, um, she had come down the stairs of our home clutching her, her chest, and I knew something was wrong. And um, we were picking blueberries at the time to bring food into the house for our family. And um, so she was persistent in wanting to go, and I kept begging her not to. Um, I was 14 at the time, and I kept begging her not to go. We can't, you're not well. And I asked Dad, you know, you gotta take her to the hospital. And he says, no, she can do whatever she wants to do and he didn't even stop her. So she was gonna go without us, so my twin brother and I decided we were going, we're not letting her go on her own. And so we went. 
And that day at lunchtime, she had not picked the amount of berries that she normally would pick. Is there that moment when you see the signs that yeah. gut feeling inside of you like it's this horrible is feeling? God. I knew, I knew something was not going to be right that day. Mm -hmm. And so at lunchtime, when we we're sitting, she was talking about there's some money hidden. It was she was talking about a future that seemed really something. I knew she wasn't going to be in it. I I don't know how to explain it, but you just know. Yeah. And by the, uh, so the conversation ended, we went back to picking berries and she hadn't called us in and the day started to get really um, chilly. Um, it, we knew that something was wrong. So my brother and I went tearing through the blueberry fields because she was not answering oh, our call. And the panic inside of her <sighs> heart that moment. So did you find her? We did, but she was gone. That's an image you probably never forget. You know, I, I can remember her laying there, but I can't remember how she looked, and I'm glad I can't, because she had had a massive heart attack in the field. Wow. God so. took her home. Yeah. He took her home. There you are, an alcoholic father, the one that tried to survive with all of you, is now gone. Mm -hmm. Did that help your dad to turn around, to walk away from alcoholism, to start taking care of the family? It made him worse. It made what? him worse. He drank even more. He wasn't there for us. He, w he didn't even help us go through the process of her death. We were totally on our own. And uh, so How I tried to... How old was the youngest? Uh, they would have been ten, year, 10 years younger than I was, so four going on five. Oh, man. So I had to take that place. Wow, what a responsibility to take on. How mm -hmm. do you even function in that. And you know, you, you guys are listening to that right now. Like this story is just unbelievable. And I know some of you right now are saying, where was God? How dare he not provide? And why don't you stay tuned? Because you'll see, even if it's not God's will, if what takes place, if his promises are so much more in what he has to offer, that doesn't mean he's not gonna make a difference. Stay tuned, we will be right back. My name is Frederica Singletary and I'm the program director at Mercy Multiplied Lincoln. I was just interviewed by Barb and it was an amazing experience. I wanted to share with you that I've learned that scripture says you're here by the word of the lamb and the blood of your testimony. And sitting here in this seat with Barb, I was able to do just that, share my personal testimony. And I challenge you to do the same. You can visit barbtv.org and you can join the many, many guests that she has in sharing your testimony. I recognize that p women of color often struggle with sharing their personal testimonies because we sometimes suffer in silence but I challenge you to heal another person by sitting in this seat and sharing your testimony. So please visit barbtv.org and share your story. The Center on Addiction website states that 40 million Americans aged 12 and older or more like one in seven abuse or are addicted to nicotine alcohol or other drugs. This is more than the number of Americans with heart conditions or diabetes or cancer. Per Karen.org, not only is alcoholism dangerous, it is potentially fatal for alcoholics and it's also costly to society at large. Recent surveys indicate that non-alcoholic members of families with an alcoholic use 10 times as much have sick leave as families without alcoholics. Additionally, 80% of these family members report an impaired ability to perform at work as a result of living with an alcoholic abuser or alcoholic. This, Diane, looks like your family. Hmm. Totally your family. So you're trying to function. Now you are basically mom. You have all these siblings. You're way too young. How old were you at this point? 14 when my mom passed. You're 14 years old. You know, if that would have been me, I'd have been angry with my mom. I was. You were. I was absolutely angry that she would die and leave us. Yeah, how dare she? Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't look at it from an adult point of view. Mm -hmm. but so, so how did you survive? What, what did it take? Because, you know, I assume your dad used to hit when he got drunk. He was very abusive to me, mainly. Uh, I don't know if it was Why because- Why you? Why I, you? Well, you know, my aunt said that I reminded him of my mother. 
Did you look like her? I, I didn't think so, but I just wonder, because I helped her so much, I wonder if I was much like her. Yeah. And that's what he couldn't handle. You know, I'm sure he had a lot of guilt with what went on and what happened. And I'm sure he must have blamed himself, but that didn't change, mm -hmm. didn't change him. I was left to pick up all the pieces or try to pick up all the pieces with my family. And I wanted them to s see our life as, as normal as we could. Why? Is it shame that comes with it or embarrassment? The promise I made my mother. She made me promise her on that day in the blueberry field that I would take care of the kids and always be there for them. And it was a promise that no, no teenager as young as I was should have had to promise That's her. That's a terrible promise. It was because I failed. I failed miserably. Yeah, but there's no way even an adult could do it. So how could a 14-year-old take a responsibility of that with an abusive father while he was drinking? So I think you just do. Um, when you look at your family and what's happening to the kids, I think that more or less drove me to do what I had to do to make sure that they were taken care of. And I was known as sister mom. Um, I wasn't a sister and I wasn't a mother, but that's what I got called. Sister mom. Sister mom. So they all looked up to you to fix their problems. Yep, they did. And there is only so long you can keep that up. What did, what did your education look like? It, did it all fall apart? N you know what, I finished grade 12. Wow. Uh, I, I did finish it, uh, but before I was uh, graduation happened, our family was taken out finally by Children's Services. How they long finally, did it take before CPS finally stepped uh, in? It would have been three years, almost three years. How could they have waited so long? I don't know what took them so long. I, I did a lot of complaining um, to the services, letting them know that there was no food, that we needed help, but nothing was happening. But what I ended up finding out is my best girlfriend's mom was the one that finally um, did something about it. She contacted them and that, that's when they came in and took all the younger kids out and put them into foster care right away. Wow, I've heard in certain states of the country it takes up to five hard cases before they actually will do anything. Yeah. And 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 because three years for that horror, so so you were all dispersed into different foster care or what did that look like? Well, the two, the four youngest, um, the two twins were five at the five no eight at the time were put into a foster care home together, and then the other two younger boys were put into the. Uh, uh, foster care home together as well on a mink farm and um, and then the rest of us I went to stay with a girlfriend uh, her her mom took me in as foster care till I uh, graduated high school and then I was uh, on my own after that and then a sister of mine got married quite young to, as a I guess a way to get out and uh, so we all and my twin brother took off we don't know know where he went Wow but he left so it's pretty tough what happened to your dad Dad just up and moved. We didn't know where he went. I didn't know where he went. Because he's still your dad. He's your family. And yeah. is, is it true what they say? It's because it's your dad. No matter what happens, you still want that bond with you him? You want that approval. You why want that is love. that? I don't know what it, why that is. I've always wanted that from my father from the time I was a little girl. And I never got it because I never knew what it was like to have his arms around me, except to hurt me. Um, I've never heard him say, I love you all my life until I was 45 years old. Wow. And um, it's, it's just something you, you want his approval. I did. I wanted his approval and his love. That's amazing. And, and you did not know God at the time, so you yeah. didn't even know there are actually options that you just try to feed that hunger probably in your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Mm -hmm. And you reason yourself away. I'm just listening to you and like, you know, to me it's a story, but to you it was a reality. Yeah, it was for many, many, many years. So how did that guilt go away once all the siblings were at other places of your mom making you make that promise? No, it never went away. It always ate at me, especially when I found out that uh, um, my siblings ended up in foster care that was abusive as well. Oh no. Um, and that wasn't healthy. Um, it, it was really hard to hear their stories and for them to blame me for it. it you know, if you hadn't have done it, we'd still be together and, and that wouldn't have happened to me. And I still have one brother today that's sort of still in that wow. mess. 
You know, he still blames me for his really for after how his future turned out. After all these years, after all these many, many that years, that means the bitterness and the pain is so deep that he mm -hmm. doesn't even able able to see or turn that around. And that might be you right now. What do you do when you're bitter and and when you struggle and you know it and you just don't know how to get out of it? I've got new good news for you. And in the third segment, we're gonna show you that oh, there is a way to turn all this around and. Sometimes you cannot count any longer on your own understanding, but there is a God. There is a real God that never intended for that to be part of your story, but will turn it around in a way that you actually can have hope, forgiveness, and love. And you might say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to forgive you. He doesn't deserve it. Well, guess who's the one in prison then? Not them, but you. Stay tuned. We'll give you the answer. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Alan Guerin with Glory Revive Ministries, and I'm coming to you live from Barb TV. And I just want to express uh, our uh, excitement about reaching into the country of Pakistan. Pakistan has such a, a great need right now. Pakistan is uh, being in the transformation state right now. There are souls coming into the kingdom of God. And if you're looking for more information, please go to barbtv.org and please sow a seed towards it today. So Diane, question is, if I would have been you, I would have probably wanted to get married just like your sister as fast as possible to get out of every situation and to try to find love in a different way. I, I've heard it of so many people. They will try to find love. So did you do that as well? I did. Um, actually, this one young fellow that, you know, at the time, um, I was uh, just graduated high school. I met him at a party. Uh, it was a drug party, and we, you know, I wasn't doing drugs then, but I, I got into that scene. It was the hippie scene, and you know how mm -hmm. it was then. And, uh, um, and this one young man paid attention to me, and I thought, hmm, I can't be all that bad. And uh, as it worked out, I ended up marrying him, and it was for all the wrong reasons. Now, if you don't know God at that point, and you're not really searching the husband that God has in your mind, Normally spoken, what I've been told through counseling sessions when I, years ago, that you end up in a cycle to go back to kind of, basically what I'm trying to say is, was your husband like your dad? Yes, he was. He was but a weekend alcoholic. But why didn't you see that any earlier? Because it was what I was used to. It was what I was used to. It was what I was, can you believe it or not, comfortable with. And you feel at home. That's and terrible. It, it is, and he was an abuser as well. He, you know, not only alcohol, but um, he used my head as a punching bag. Wow. Um, so there were things that were, you know, that same vicious circle, and you How get caught up How long did it take it. you to get out of it? Seven years. Why is that number seven so often the case? I hear it all the time, six and a half, seven years. So you get out of it, you're lonely, then what? And then um, I started searching, I knew that, when he and I, when our marriage finally was over, um, God started having, I, I knew there was something about God. I, it, the old things about my mom started coming back. And I don't know what it was, but um, I, I just started to search. And then I met my second husband. I still wasn't a Christian, but I met my second husband. And the first question I had when I met him, and I waited and I watched, and it was, will the real Rob stand up? because I was waiting again for another man to abuse me because not only did my father, I was sexually abused by one of my older brothers mm. and then I was into that relationship that I should never have gotten into and married. Now I was waiting again. Is this gonna happen all over again? And it didn't. The real Rob was the real Rob. He never abused, he never called me names, he never, uh, you know, what I was used to was not happening. Were you able to accept that? Sort of. I wanted to desperately because I kn knew something had to change. And then into our relationship, um, we weren't married yet. Um, we were living together. But what ended up happening is um, something in my life, my old life, the old baggage, the suicide attempts still were there. And this was a weekend of thinking about committing suicide again because I couldn't get rid of those thoughts that I'd had all my life about how I'd messed up and failed. Mm. And um, so one day I just got up out of bed, walked into a, a church, and I walked into this classroom and they were talking about forgiveness. 
Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I was right. I was Are mad. you like, yay, I want that? Or like, how dare you? Oh, how what direction did you go? How dare you? I was angry. So I waited for everybody to leave that class, and I went up to the couple, and I... You and let them have it? I let them have it, and not in so... I wasn't kind about it. And I said, how dare you? And use the language that I would use, because I, I was not... I was angry that day because that was the day I was going to end my life. It actually came out. Yeah, and so the man looked at me and he said, do you want life to go on the way it is or do you want change? What and that wisdom. right there did it for me. Yeah, wow. and that, cha that changed it forever for me. Wow, so you, you became a Christian. I accepted the Lord that morning. Did you start asking and God said, where were you all this time? Why did you allow this to happen? Or were you more, thank you God for turning things around? I think around? I was more thankful because I'd already told God how much I hated him in the past. Oh my goodness. For taking mom and for doing all the things that he did. But this morning was such a change for me. Something totally changed. It felt like this weight had just been lifted right off me that morning. I can't explain it. I don't know how it happened. All I know is that something changed for me. I went home and something had happened in my husband's and, or Rob in my life up to that point, and that's why um, things were not going well for us. But that morning, I walked into our home, and I looked at him, and I said, from this day on, things will be different. And they were. And they were. Because when you say it, when you receive it, God will bring it. Yes. So, wow. So that, that's quite amazing because God finally got your attention and that yeah. seed was planted with your mom who was a closet Christian at the time. Yes. You're like, how God uses those moments that mm -hmm. you're like, wow, yay God, you mm -hmm. know, yay, yay God. So you said you were uh, physically or, or sexually abused by your brother. Yeah. Were you able to forgive him at that point or does that take more time? Oh no. The process just began when I got saved. And uh, at that time, I was about 33 years old when I got saved, and that would not now happen until 40, until I turned 45. So I wow. had there was a process that I was going through, just trying to get my head on straight and and see the purposes and plans that God had for me, because His Word says that He had plans and purposes for my life, and that I did have ho some hope, because at that point I was hopeless. Wow! Now you, you know? wrote a book about all this. I did. Your title is amazing. Give me that title one more time. It's called From Hand-Me-Downs to the Designer's Label, and God gave me that name. Wow, He revealed it to you. He did. And, and why that title? Uh, I love designer labels. I really do. When I go clothes shopping, I love designer labels. But the picture He showed me right away when He showed me the hand-me-downs, He showed me in a prison outfit. And I could see wow. all over myself. I had POE on the back, which was prisoner of the enemy. And then I saw all these labels, and they were labels that I'd lived all my life. And I was still in that. And so one by one, I had to get rid of all those labels in order to don the designer's label for my wow. life. And that label was who he said I was, and who I could be, and what I could do. Wow. Now, Diane, if somebody would like to read that book, and I read it, it, it is a must read. I, I'm like, you touched me when I read that book. I was like, I had tears in my <laughs> eyes. I was like, oh my goodness, it's your story. Mm -hmm. But if somebody would like to get hold of your book, uh, what's your website? Well, I do. My website is D I A N N A L S E Y M O U R dot com. So they can contact me there or email me directly at D L underscore Seymour at hotmail dot com. All right, thank you. We're going to do a second segment to this because you know what happened to your dad? I want to know, and I'm sure you want to know it too. So thank you for being with us today. And what I just I want to talk to you about it for a moment because when I was asking the Lord, when the stories are so horrific, what do you tell the people? And He gave me a word from you and it's right out of His Word. And it's a very famous Bible scripture that only gives you usually part A, but I'd like you to listen to part B very carefully today. And it's out of Proverbs 3, starting at verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. And I don't think that needs to have the explanation of words right now. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. He showed Diana to go into a little church, and even if she got really mad about it, it changed her despair to hope. And then listen to this. 
Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Don't think you have all the answers. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You might be saying at this moment, what evil? It's the other person that is wrong. But the moment the unforgiveness comes into your heart, you are just as wrong because you become part of what they've done to you. And it says, then you will have healing for your body. Wait, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. I read a promise in here. When you do what God is asking you to do is to trust in Him, to not depend on your own understanding, to seek His will in all you do, to not be impressed with your own wisdom, instead to fear the Lord, then He will be bring, bringing healing to you. And that, my friend, is what you can have today as well. We'd love to pray with you. Go to 855-515-5550 or Barb. TV.org. How do you forgive, Diana? How, how do you turn it around? Cold. And what hit me the hardest was what it was because of what Jesus had done. He forgave when he didn't have to. He was he was beaten, he was scorned, everything was done to him, and yet he was silent through the whole thing. And then and you're there and i remember when i went home once every moment is like is this the right moment do i wait and it's almost like those moments evaporate that it's not the right moment how did you know when it was i don't know what else to do but when you realize that god forgave them too that he loves them just as much as he loves you what right do i have to hold hatred and anger and unforgiveness and bitterness against them. Were you looking for it to have an alone yeah. moment with your oh, dad? was I ever. I was praying that God, you gotta give me time with him. And sure enough, here it happened. And